going to talk briefly using some case descriptions about bradycardia and its management pre-hospital because many services will have an algorithm involving atropine and adrenaline or epinephrine followed by transcutaneous pacing and what I want us to do before we go down that pathway is to think about whether it's actually a cardiac cause of bradycardia and whether treatment pre-hospital is appropriate or likely to be effective. So the questions to ask are, is this bradycardic patient having a bradycardia that's relevant to their presentation? And if so, is it causing or contributing to a low cardiac output? And if that's the case, is the cause likely to be cardiac? Because toxic and metabolic causes of bradycardia often won't respond to our cardiac treatments. Does it need to be treated now? on scene and what treatments are actually likely to work and are there any other competing priorities regarding treatments or transport decisions so here's our local protocol and quite sensibly it requires assessment to determine if the pulse rate is compromising the hemodynamic status and we have this key decision is the patient bradycardic with signs of hemodynamic compromise and if they are, we go on to the algorithm. But what I want to encourage is just this step of adding these questions during the clinical assessment to see if treatment's appropriate and likely to be effective. So let's start with an 88-year-old lady from her own home, trips, fractures her neck of femur, and she has a bradycardia with hypotension. However, she is alert and peripherally warm and does not appear to be shocked. Her 12-lead ECG is shown and it looks like she has complete heart block. So is the bradycardia relevant to the presentation? Well, she tripped, it wasn't syncope, so probably not. Is it causing or contributing to a low cardiac output? No, it doesn't seem to be. Is the cause likely, likely to be cardiac? Well, yes, but does it need to be treated now? No. What treatments are likely to work? Well, atropine may work, adrenaline or epinephrine, pacing may work, but are there competing priorities? Yes, there are. We need to manage her pain and get her to hospital for management of her neck of femur fracture. So it may well be that some of our analgesics like intravenous opioids will further compromise blood pressure. So that might be a stimulus to treating the circulatory side of things first or choosing an alternative analgesic, like in our case, inhaled methoxyfluorine might be appropriate. So just a reminder that blood pressure is the cardiac output multiplied by the systemic vascular resistance. So if you're peripherally vasodilated, you have a low SVR, your BP can be low with a normal or high cardiac output. And your cardiac output is made up of your heart rate times the amount the heart is beating with each beat, which is the stroke volume. So your heart rate may be low or your stroke volume may be low, co contributing to a low cardiac output. So your patient may be bradycardic and hypotensive, but there may be other contributors to that low, bradyc that low blood pressure, like a low SVR or low stroke volume from volume or contractility issues that are independent of that bradycardia. Let's look at the next case, which is a 33-year-old Australian indigenous dialysis patient found on his friends, uh, found by his friends on the floor um, with some circumstantial evidence of intoxication with drugs and alcohol, uh, possible overdose, and he's bradycardic, hypotensive, he has a depressed conscious level, his blood sugar level is slightly high, and his temperature is normal and he has a bradycardia on his ECG. So is that relevant to the presentation? Yes, it probably is. Is it causing or contributing to a low cardiac output? Probably. Is the cause likely to be cardiac? Well, probably not. He's got metabolic issues going on. He's a dialysis patient who's probably missed his dialysis, so he may be hyperkalemic. And there may be, may be drugs on board that are contributing to the low blood pressure and or the bradycardia. Does it need to be treated now? Well, potentially, particularly if he's getting worse. And what treatments are likely to work? Well, it's important to bear in mind that hyperkalemia, a high potassium, can result in bradycardia on the ECG, can result in heart block on the ECG, independent of any other features like peak T waves, for example. So there are peak T waves on this ECG, but remember that's not a sensitive or specific sign for hyperkalemia. We can't rely on it. And in this case, the patient's bradycardia was due to a high K. So the treatment that's likely to work in his case is calcium. Any competing priorities regarding treatment or transport? Well, yes, the management of his intoxication and overdose and need for dialysis. 
So a 75-year-old male from his own home has been lethargic for a week. There's been gastroenteritis in the family, and they called an ambulance today because his son couldn't get him out of the chair. He's got a background of prostatic hypertrophy and hypertension. He's on some medication for that. He's bradycardic, hypotensive. He's got a depressed conscious level, and he's peripherally cool. So is the bradycardia relevant to the presentation? Probably. Is it causing or contributing to a low cardiac output? Probably. Is it likely to be cardiac? Well, it might be, but his BPH may be contributing to some renal impairment, and he may have been tipped over into an acute kidney injury with dehydration from his gastroenteritis. He may be on antihypertensive medication, like beta blockers or ACE inhibitors or calcium antagonists. Um, so there are other causes for his bradycardia than cardiac. Does it need to be treated now? Well, uh, there can be a number of factors that decide that, but there are other competing priorities, like getting him to hospital for investigation and management of these other metabolic um, and drug-related factors. So if he's severely compromised or getting worse, then yes, we need to manage his bradycardia. But what treatments are likely to work if it's a toxic or metabolic cause is another thing. So this guy, in fact, has Brash syndrome. The image is taken from the MCRIT website, and I'd encourage you to visit that page to learn more about this. And BRASH stands for bradycardia, renal failure, AV nodal blockers, shock, and hypotension. And you get this vicious circle of a poorly perfused kidney giving rise to renal failure and a high potassium, which gives rise to bradycardia, which further compromises renal perfusion. Patients are on drugs like beta blockers or calcium channel blockers that block the AV node and impaired renal excretion of these drugs causes them to accumulate and patients become more bradycardic. You may be on other drugs like ACE inhibitors that contribute to hyperkalemia. So sometimes these patients need management of the high potassium, but more so need the drugs to flush out of the system um, with supportive care and management of their renal failure in the meantime. Here's a 65-year-old female who's not been seen for days and she's found on the floor, bradycardic, hypotensive, depressed conscious level, hypothermic and hypoglycemic. Her ECG is abnormal for bradycardia, also some small complexes and some inverted T waves. Now, is the bradycardia relevant to the presentation? Yes. Contributing to a low cardiac output? Yes. Likely to be cardiac? Probably not. Does it need to be treated now? Well, she needs some supportive management. And the treatments that are likely to work here is thyroxine. This is a myxedema coma or hypothyroid coma. And is the classic constellation of depressed conscious level bradycardia, hypothermia, and hypoglycemia. Now, we're not going to make that diagnosis uh, clinically with 100% confidence without doing the um, screen of her blood tests. So uh, she needs a whole bunch of investigation and supportive care. But she may not respond to management of her bradycardia using a purely cardiac algorithm. So we want to give her glucose, we want supportive care, look after her airway, maybe warm her up and uh, get her to hospital. Here's a 22 year old 38 kilogram female who's taken an overdose of sertraline just in the last 30 minutes and someone called an ambulance. She's bradycardic and hypotensive but she's alert and uh, has no issues with blood sugar or temperature, peripherally a bit cool and she has a sinus bradycardia. So this young lady notices a very low uh, weight. She actually has an eating disorder, and anorectic patients often have an accompanying bradycardia um, that won't necessarily uh, improve until they are better metabolically in general. So the bradycardia may be relevant to her presentation, may not, but probably isn't, and in fact, She's only taken the overdose very recently, so she's probably not getting any toxic effects from it just yet. And we do have competing priorities here. Um, she needs to be monitored and have supportive care for her overdose. Okay, here's a really important case, an acute inferior STEMI. This is a 49-year-old male with chest pain, dizziness, and he's shocked. Now, you'll see in the ECG he's got either a complete heart block or probably more likely a two-to-one block and inferior ST elevation. So he clearly needs reperfusion, needs to get to a cath lab or have pre-hospital thrombolysis if you're a remote rural practitioner. But we need to bear in mind here, managing his bradycardia uh, might not be the priority. 
Now his heart rate's 49, he's got a bad blood pressure, but it could be worse, and we might expedite him to a cath lab. Uh, but if the blood pressure's dropping, f- uh, sorry, if the heart rate's dropping further, let's say it's dropped to 30 and he's looking worse, then clearly we're going to want to manage that bradycardia through the cardiac bradycardia algorithm. But let's bear a few things in mind. The first is that in inferior STEMI, you can often get ischemia to the conduction system, and the bradycardia can be secondary to that and responds to reperfusion. So the cath lab will be the cure for the bradycardia as well as the STEMI. The other thing is that most inferior STEMIs just affect the inferior part of the left ventricle, don't cause enough LV damage to make the patient shocked, and has a relatively benign prognosis when compared with an anterior STEMI. But when you've got a sick hypotensive inferior STEMI, that's more likely to be due to a blocked right coronary artery causing a right ventricular infarct. So there's more than just a bit of the left ventricle, you've got an RV infarct. And a clue to that is that the ST elevation is taller in three than in two. Three looks more to the right than two does. In fact, on this 12 lead of an RV STEMI, you've got ST elevation that's higher in three than in two, suggesting RV. And that's confirmed also by ST elevation in V1, which is also looking more to the right ventricle than left ventricle. So we're worried about this guy. He's got probably a right ventricular cardiogenic shock, which carries a very high mortality and requires urgent reperfusion. So we do not want to be delayed on the scene, focusing on the bradycardia, which is likely to respond anyway to reperfusion. So it's pacing pads on the chest and get going, giving him the aspirin, analgesia, and thinking about how we might support that circulation en route. 78-year-old male with syncope and dizziness. He's got a heart rate of 40. He's hypotensive. He's alert, though, but peripherally cool. And you can see on his ECG, he has pacing spikes. If you look to the right-hand side, he's got two pacing spikes that are not followed by QRSs and then one that does. So he's got intermittent loss of capture from his permanent pacemaker. Now, this patient is the perfect pre-hospital pacing patient if he's hemodynamically compromised. He has no other time-critical emergency. The bradycardia is relevant to the presentation. It is contributing to a low cardiac output. The cause is likely to be cardiac. It does need to be treated now. The treatment that's likely to work is pacing, and there aren't really any competing priorities regarding treatment or transport decisions. You could spend a couple of days on scene with this guy without doing him too much harm. Now, 73-year-old male with Melina, who's on warfarin, is hypotensive, bradycardic, peripherally cool, and very pale. This is a classic case where we really do not want to focus on a bradycardia algorithm. This guy's bleeding to death, and bradycardia is a feature of life-threatening hemorrhage, even if you haven't initially gone through a tachycardic phase, even if you're not on beta blockers. You have pressure receptors in the great vessels and in the heart, and when they detect hypovolemia, they will slow the heart down so that it can adequately fill with some volume before it pumps. Whereas a tachycardia, when you're significantly hypovolemic is going to be fruitless you're you're pumping an empty heart so the bradycardia is a physiologic response to major hemorrhage and he needs volume preferably blood products he also needs reversal of his anticoagulation and he needs to turn off the tap with surgery or interventional radiology so this is a patient that gets expedited to hospital with uh, um, circulatory resuscitation en route So I hope that was a useful rundown of some cases, all of whom are bradycardic, but not all of whom are going to respond to a pre-hospital cardiac bradycardia algorithm. Paramedics are great clinicians who do excellent assessments and who often underestimate the superpower they have, which is to strongly influence what the emergency department then thinks about and does with the patient. For example, the myxedema coma. If you've thought of that pre-hospital and you sow that seed You plant that seed in the brains of the emergency doctors and nurses. The diagnosis is going to be made sooner. And similarly with these things, think outside the box. Do a thorough assessment of the patient. If you're going down the cardiac bradycardia algorithm, that's great. But remember, there are plenty of bradycardic patients for whom that's not appropriate. Think about these questions for all symptomatic bradycardia patients because those with toxic and metabolic or endocrine causes of bradycardia often won't respond to our first-line cardiac therapies.
that's it. Thanks for listening.